I spend hours inside my head just fighting irrational thoughts, self-blame, images and flashes that I don't want to see, that are stored from a lifetime of pain and suffering. It feels like I'm being watched or stalked. Everyone sort of just seems to be scowling at me. I was just homeless two years ago. I have absolutely no family contact. I was the monster that they wanted to keep hidden because I was an embarrassment and I wasn't worth anything to them. I have no hope. It feels like I have no future. Being forced to live in poverty and fear and without security, it's been too much. Social anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. What is that a list of? All of the mental illnesses I'm suffering from. Mitchell is 41, and for most of his life, he's been searching for relief from his mental pain. Paxil, Celexa, Lexpro, Zola, Prozac. So these are all the drugs you actually try? Yeah, there's 43 of them in total. People tell me, you gotta try harder. I tried every single medication, I tried every therapy. I've tried literally everything. He can't work because of his illnesses, so he relies on government assistance. You can't afford rent. You can't afford groceries when you're on disability support. I'm making do with nothing. If your disability doubled, you'd still be below the poverty line. Yes, like we're all, we're drowning here. Soon, Canada will offer Mitchell a way out. In March of 2024, people with mental illnesses will be eligible to apply for medical assistance in dying, or MAID, the government's euthanasia program. When I first heard about it, I got really excited because I've never been able to do it myself. I've lost track of how many times I've tried to end it. In just a few years, Canada has gone from banning euthanasia to being one of the most permissive countries in the world for those seeking it. It's prompted a heated debate about whether the country is making it easier for people to die than get the help they need to live. It's the same government that's giving out MAID that is actually denying people services in a socialized universal health care system. I don't actually care enough about you to fix your poverty or try to find ways to advocate for you, but I can end your life. I think Canadians have always felt like people should be able to choose. As long as people are being assessed and found eligible and they're choosing this death, who are we to decide that it's not the right choice? How much of this, your desire for MAID, is driven by economics? I'd say a very large portion of it. There's a lack of support. I really needed a while ago. I've given up on everything. You know, I'm barely two steps out of the gutter at all times, and I just want to be gone. I didn't choose to get born, but I can choose to die. When you think of physician-assisted suicide, you probably picture a cancer patient nearing the end of their life. And that's how it started when Canada legalized it in 2016. But in 2021, it was broadened out to include other people who were sick or disabled, but not in immediate risk of dying. Like Rosina Camus, a 41-year-old woman from Malaysia, isolated after leaving her faith and moving to a new country, she looked for connection online. That's how Rosina met Naeem in 2007. He was one of her only friends. So how did you meet Rosina? So uh, she had posted, uh, I'm an ex-Muslim from Malaysia. That got my attention. How would you describe her? What was she like? Um, I would say she was a straight shooter, which is what made some people uncomfortable. But that's who she was as a person. So we hung out, I guess, two, three more times. And then she asked me, like, oh, can we be friends? And I said, I didn't know you had to ask formally. Like, it's, it's like, you know, yeah, we are friends. In the beginning, she was perfectly fine. Walking was an issue. Like, we'd go for walks with the dog and stuff. 
In her 20s, Rosina developed fibromyalgia, a chronic pain disorder. She also suffered from a number of psychiatric illnesses. Yeah, here I am in Canada. I went to Canada's top university. Everything was fine and dandy. I had a lot of job opportunities, and I was a good student. The fibromyalgia made it difficult for her to work, and she began to rely on disability assistance. Someone used to teach statistics at a university to become somebody who's on disability by the government, and it's not enough to survive. Uh, more cases Almost half of her government assistance went toward renting a small basement room in Toronto. In the summer of 2020, she faced eviction because of her service dog. No, I don't care. You're putting dog toys in a place where we store our food. Why are you putting dog toys in a place where we store our food? Is what you're not understanding. I'm putting dog toys. I don't care. You're calling the cops on us over dog toys. Stop. She looked for help online and met this housing rights activist. It was around a tenant issue that I initially... He asked us to conceal his identity. It was just because the landlord didn't want a dog there. So the eviction was groundless. He became Rosina's close friend and saw the difficulty she faced in her day-to-day -day life. This is me. I'm next. Him. Sitting on my lap. Rosina would be kind of clearly living out of her bed. And there was just lots of garbage around. They're really torn things apart here. And down um, here too, you see. And like these pee pads and stuff that were used by the dog and food rotting like in the fridge or on the counter that she wasn't able to clean up or prepare. And yeah, it was just, I saw this person completely overwhelmed by this like isolation. So I feel really bad not being able to bring doggy to the dog park. I'm having a really bad migraine or headache or some sort. Rosina was getting even sicker. Like just something was happening to her body. And I think Rosina was incredibly clear that she wanted immediate relief from her pain symptoms. Chronic pain, and just pain, pain, pain from head to toe. We both had fibromyalgia, and I was able to get some treatment through medication that Rosina wasn't able to get. He joined Rosina for dozens of medical appointments. I think we really need to think about, like, how can we bring some autonomy to Rosina um, in her daily life? And, like, part of it right now is an effective medication. Can I just make a comment um, about chronic pain management? Uh, you know, medications play a very small part. They're kind of useless, especially in the long term. There was just like a total inability to take the suffering seriously. It really felt like the doctors and nurses just kind of talked down to her a lot. As her condition worsened, Rosina started looking for other options. I have always been a proponent of euthanasia because I know how it is uh, to suffer. Uh, suffer so greatly that your life is not worth living anymore. Well, this when medical way. assistance in dying first became legal in Canada in 2016, she didn't qualify. In the first few years of assisted dying, the vast majority of cases are things like cancer, where clinicians are reasonably able to determine when the person will die. But by early 2021, that was about to change. A group of Canadians with disabilities and chronic health conditions filed a lawsuit, arguing they should also be eligible for physician-assisted suicide. They were living intolerable lives where they decided that at some point they would probably want to choose to die, but they couldn't do that because their deaths were not reasonably foreseeable. And their argument was that as a group, they were being discriminated against because they didn't have the same right to choose to end their suffering. But UN experts, the Canadian Human Rights Commission, 
Indigenous and disability groups, and professionals across the medical community all voiced their concern over MAID's expansion beyond terminal illnesses. We will become a place in Canada where you can receive a lethal injection before the standard of good care is actually applied if this bill passes without amendment. Individuals are left with the prospect of choosing between an assisted death or continuing the uphill struggle of living with inadequate support. But the court ruled in favor of extending the right to die. People should be able to get everything they need to live and that should be the first priority of our government. But you can't hold the MAID system hostage because there's a lack of supports in other areas. MAID's expansion came into effect on March 17, 2021. Just three weeks before, Rosina had gotten yet another diagnosis, a chronic type of leukemia. I just got it. This is the first bottle of my cancer medication. Supposed to prolong my life for another 40 to 50 years. Now, do I want this kind of life? I don't know. I'm already suffering. Within weeks, she called the Canadian government's maid hotline. Hello, my name is Rosina Camus. The reason I'm calling is because I would like to access Medicaid and dying. And I want to know uh, how to do so, uh, when I will be able to do so, and so on. The thing that I would say 98% of them have in common is that they are very happy to be choosing to die and to be able to die. They've made the choice, they're clear about it, and they welcome it. Dr. Chantel Perot has dedicated her entire practice to MAID. One of the last questions I'll ask them is, the medication I have with me today will cause your death. Do you want to die today? And if they say yes, then I proceed to administer the medications. And if they say no, I would pack up and go away, but that's never happened. She is confident in the MAID system. In Canada, at this point, we have a very careful process with some significant safeguards built in that makes the possibility for abuse never impossible, but certainly very, very remote. To receive MAID, Rosina had to undergo a psychiatric evaluation, assessments by two medical providers, and then, if approved, wait 90 days. These are the system's main safeguards to ensure that suffering from a physical illness is the primary reason for wanting to die. How long does a good assessment take normally? I generally spend at least an hour and a half to three hours with patients and their families. I want to hear how they describe their living situation and how those circumstances influence their decision to have made. One of the series of questions that I asked them is, is about our financial concerns contributing in any way to your request for MAID. And if someone says yes, then I explore that further to try to better understand that. But if someone were to say they want MAID solely because of their financial circumstances, that's not going to happen. But maybe it's loneliness driving this. Like, how would you separate that out? Sometimes I'll ask point blank, is loneliness a factor? And sometimes they'll say yes. And if someone says, you know, if I had visitors, I wouldn't want MAID, that's a difficult one. While Rosina continued to struggle with her medical care and living conditions, her MAID application progressed rapidly. When was the first time you heard Rosina had actually applied for MAID? And what'd you think about that? Yeah, I guess it, it happened really fast, just in that, like, one night Rosina was talking to the guy that was eventually going to give her the injection. I'm talking to you about medical assistance in dying. Yeah, I guess for Yeah. Right. Like she got his phone number and was like texting with him. Okay, so it takes a few months, you're saying? Yeah, no, I can do it like next weekend if you're eligible. What surprised you about that? Well, no other doctor was that accessible. You get the guy who's gonna kill you's number like so quickly, but the guy who can sign off on your pain meds is like a specter. <laughs> <laughs> it's like vanished into thin air. Oh, hi, Rosina. This is Terry. I'm with the Provincial Program for Medical Assistance in Dying. Okay. Okay, and doctor, I just spoke with him. He said he booked a procedure date for you. This person was totally ignored, and death was made more accessible than getting some food to eat or getting some stuff for their pain. 
And most of the time, Rosina said what she wanted most was for someone to be there and just hold her hand. And that even I wasn't really able to do that. Are you crying? Yeah. <laughs> Can you come and be with me? <laughs> I want to go. <laughs> On September 25th, 2021, a doctor gave Rosina a lethal injection. That's the room where she did the main yeah. procedure. Yeah, they came right in. They did it right here in her room, and then they left. And she was there for hours before the coroners came got her. And they just left her body. <laughs> yeah, right on her bed. It's it's absolutely crazy, man. There's like two sides to the story where she's like pushing for. Before Rosina died, she gave Naeem access to her email and social media accounts so he could share her story. He found this email. The subject line was, why I want made ASAP and what needs to be done. Please keep all this secret while I'm still alive because there are things that would cause a made application to be declined, such as suffering I experience is mental suffering, not physical. Dealing with healthcare providers who refuse to take the suffering away when they can. Constant worrying about not having food to eat. She's saying here, that she wants to keep this secret mm -hmm. because she knew that wasn't a qualification. Right. And she says, I think if more people cared about me, yeah. I might be able to handle the suffering caused by my physical illness alone. Yeah. It's just loneliness. It's isolation and it's poverty. Oh yeah, absolutely. The maid system is supposed to not let this happen. Happen, yeah. It's confirmed my fears that this is what she did it for. Dr. Perel wasn't Rosina's maid provider, but we asked her to look at the note Rosina left. Is this somebody who's been found eligible for maid? Yeah. And that last paragraph, I think, is... The please keep all this secret? Yeah. Yeah, that would certainly give me pause. That would give you pause? Yeah, absolutely. Should an assessment have been able to suss that out? Possibly. I think without being there, it would be impossible to, to, to really tell. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a tragic situation all the way around. Do I think euthanasia is the only solution? Probably not. It's the only solution here in Canada when you don't have your family. The government doesn't want to give you enough money to survive. But one thing I know is for sure, when a person is suffering, you don't leave them alone with nobody at all. Sometimes all the pain will go away just by having another human being here. It's a massive indictment on their whole society. And it's like a really shameful mirror. And it's because we won't do something simple like build housing for people or just feed people. And I think that's why the dignity is so appealing, because it just says that none of that stuff needs to be addressed, that it's just an individual exercising their autonomy, and that that's a beautiful thing. I think Canadians in general really do care and do think that they're offering a service that is very merciful for people who have nothing left that we can offer them. But actually, the government is not fulfilling its duties to Canadians by prioritizing medical assistance in time. It's easier to get made in some places in the country than a wheelchair. I had raised concerns that inequalities and circumstances such as poverty, trauma... Months after Rosina's death, Dr. Ramona Coelho testified about flaws in the MAID system. A man had a small stroke affecting his balance and swallowing. The patient was depressed and isolated due to COVID-19. She told stories of patients who had received MAID before fully recovering from curable illnesses. Neither of his MAID assessors had any experience in stroke rehabilitation and recovery. No safeguards were technically broken, and yet he died when acutely down, isolated, and had not experienced living with maximal recovery from his stroke. Some places in Canada, we have surpassed 7% of deaths are from MAID. 
And in the Netherlands, they did do a study that showed when needs are not met that people are more likely to choose made. I consider it as well. Consider what's my life going to be like in 10 years when my body keeps aging, you know, and my pain gets worse because of that, my mobility gets worse, and I can't do the little things that I do to get through the day. I don't want to go through the violence of killing myself, really, but this now seems like an option because that door is open, and it feels like we are being led into this door. In 2022, there were more than 13,000 made deaths in Canada, a 31% increase from the year before. Patients like Rosina, who did not have a reasonably foreseeable death, accounted for just 3% of the total. Yet that's actually double what it was the previous year. I don't think anyone's running around looking to help people die early or inappropriately. I think the system is good. There are safeguards in place. The people who do the work are careful, compassionate people. I don't think the number is the problem. I think the right number is the people who meet the criteria and who have chosen that that's how they'd like to die. <clears throat> testing, testing. Now, Canadians with mental illness, like Mitchell, are anticipating MADE. I think most people's greatest fear is dying. If you don't have a fear of dying, what do you fear? It's definitely living. With me, what am I supposed to learn? That, yeah, it's all going to fail again. You're going to lose everything again. You're not an equal. You're not normal. The biggest reason why I want made is the fear. And the fear is nonstop. Uh, I'm, I'm about to go homeless. It's just the same thing again. You might have a person who's got tens of years of mental illness challenges, who's tried every treatment, electric shock therapy, medications, counseling, all of those things, and they have been unable to get any relief from their mental disorder. Just because their suffering is mental doesn't make it any less important or less severe than if it's a physical suffering. Those individuals need to have the opportunity to ask if they want to and to be assessed. Do you think there'll be a rush when they open this up? Oh yeah, 100%. Why? We're sick of living like this. Nobody cares about us. It's the craziest thing too, because people with disabilities are the largest minority in the world. When we see something like this, like made, where your options are you suffer or you die, and that's it. Those are your two options. There's no living that you can do that is livable. It's suicide, but it's facilitated. And that's what I want. It's what I've wanted for a very long time. Beyond facilitated, do you believe it's coerced? Yeah. I mean, I can have both beliefs at the same time. It is coercion, and yeah, I'm throwing myself into the gears, but I get to get out. He thought he'd be eligible in 2023 but the government pushed the expansion back a year for further study. What is different about mental illness and why is this alarming that it's going through? The majority of people with mental illness will get better. It could be five, 10, 15 years, but we don't know who's not gonna get better and we could just be funneling people into a program helping them commit suicide when they could have benefited from suicide prevention. Do you feel like the mental challenges that you're going through are incurable? Yeah. I think they started so young that it's kind of really hard to do a course correction now. And all the doctors have said the same thing. Do I fantasize about MADE? 100%. I lay there and I think about being in that room, just relaxing and going into that black void and finally being done with all of this crap. That's my dream now. 